Good afternoon. Welcome to the second lecture in our IBC Commerce Bank keynote speaker series for 2020 and 2021. I'm George Clark, Director of the Center for the Study of Western Hemispheric Trade at TAMIU's A.R. Sanchez Junior School of Business. Our center, along with um, IBC Bank and Commerce Bank, bring, bring speakers to talk about topics in the areas of international trade, international economics, finance, demography, and immigration. Before introducing today's speaker, I'd like to be, I'd like to thank our sponsors, IBC Bank and Commerce Bank. With their support, we've made, been able to bring many thought-provoking speakers throughout the years to TAMIU and to Laredo. Before I introduce the speaker, I'd like to do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, at the end of um, Dr. Pradhan's session, session, there'll be a question and answer session. We'll take questions from our virtual audience via the WebEx Q&A feature. For those of you attending the on-campus viewing at TAMIU Student Center Ballroom, you may write down your questions and provide them to our staff and volunteers who will enter your questions into the WebEx system. We'll try to address as many questions as our allotted time allows. Um, for students attending online, your class information should have been submitted during the registration process. For students attending in person, um, and on behalf of one of your classes, you should have had your student ID scanned at the door. In addition, you're provided with a QR code, which, which will take you to the online form where you will submit your class information. Finally, you'll scan your ID when departing once um, the lecture has ended. So thank you for joining us, um, either virtually or in person at uh, the student ballroom. Today's speaker is Dr. Manoj Pradhan. He is the founder of Talking Heads Macroeconomics. He has a PhD in economics from George Washington University and a master's of finance from the London Business School. He served on the faculties at George Washington University and the State University of New York. He was most recently the managing director at Morgan Stanley where he led the global economics team. He joined Morgan Stanley in 2005 after serving on the faculty of George Washington University and the State University of New York. Um, Dr. Pradhan works on thematic global macroeconomics with a focus on emerging markets. Today, Dr. Pradhan is going to talk about his best-selling book, co-authored with Dr. Charles Goodhart, The Great Demographic Reversal. The book's available for sale at the TAMIU bookstore, and for those attending the on-site viewing, they're set up outside the ballroom. So let's welcome Dr. Pradhan to TAMIU and to Laredo. Thank you very much for having me. It's a great pleasure to be here. I wish I could be there in person, but hopefully uh, travel starts very soon. Um, thank you very much to Texas A&M International University, your sponsors, um, and Dr. Clark, thanks for the kind introduction and the opportunity to speak here. Um, I'm just waiting for sharing privileges so I can I can start my slides. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today um, about our broad thesis um, about why demography is likely to be inflationary um, and why the cyclical story and uh, the COVID related inflation uh, is going to be one of the most interesting puzzles that we will solve for a very long period of time. So I, I wanted to start with just a little visualization with no real numbers thrown at it. This is just something that I hope uh, you can take back with you as a visual image of what we're expecting. Uh, while we see one number coming out of the inflation data, what is happening below that is there are really three inflation cycles at play. Most of the panic that seems to be uh, affecting individuals, most of the panic that seems to be uh, concerning uh, or uh, used cars or the unavailability of uh, labor has to do with supply shortages uh, given a surge in demand and that is related to an uneven recovery as the Federal Reserve called it at Jackson Hole. That type of inflation is the dominant form of inflation at this point in time. There is, however, something that central banks are not yet paying attention to um, and that is cyclical inflation that cyclical inflation has to do with Phillips curve, which central banks believe is no longer a predictor of inflation, uh, not a reliable forecaster, and to do with monetary impulses driving that story higher, uh, which is what Milton Friedman told us many years ago. Uh, and most of the time, we've been able to dodge our way past this, but such as the surge in monetary growth that it is difficult to ignore it, and yet that's exactly what we're doing. But the mainstay of my discussion over here is going to be that little gray line, uh, which is demographic inflation. Now, many of you looking at this for the first time may see, well, why is the uh, easiest type of inflation uh, the most dominant part of this discussion? 
what's interesting here is that for the last 35 years, we have had inflation because of demography come down consistently. And think about what that does as an anchor for overall inflation. Anytime there has been a cyclical episode of inflation during a business cycle during the boom years, because demography over the last 30 or 35 years was consistently bringing inflation lower, that cyclical inflation would be drawn down by the gravitational pull of demography. The fact that it may have flattened and be marginally upward sloping is a huge change and changes the way inflation will behave over the cycle and indeed the way inflation may behave over the next 20 or 30 years. We don't really know what the future is going to look like, but the one thing we are absolutely sure of, Charles and myself, is that the future is going to look nothing like the past. But with that, let me walk you through the structural part of the story and then the cyclical side of that story. Our argument in a nutshell is that structurally, demography and some reversal of globalization will raise inflation. Let's start with the three uh, historic demographic transformation, uh, two of which are embedded in here. One is the rise of China and the second is um, demography and its integration into the global labor supply. So until about 1980 or even until 1990, the total labor force that was available for global production was the blue line. That's the WAP or the working age population of the advanced economies. Um, as you can see, that population was growing quite nicely and is now slowing down. But the really interesting part of the story is the yellow line. As China got more and more integrated, opening up from 1979, but critically joining the global trading and uh, manufacturing system in the 90s, and in a big way after the year 2000 in which the US Congress granted China most favored nation status, the effective available global labor supply that was around in the global economy became the blue plus the yellow line. In our opinion, there has never ever in history been a global positive labor supply shock as big as this, and there is unlikely to be another one. In fact, the only comparable labor supply shock that we can think of goes in the opposite direction when the Black Death uh, that really unfortunate episode killed off about 25% of the labor supply that was available and led to an absolutely gigantic increase in wages. This had the opposite effect. The equilibrium wage rate was set in China. And as China got increasingly integrated with the global economy, a point I'll come back to later on, the equilibrium wage in China lowered real earnings for most of the advanced economies manufacturing sector very steadily, but very surely over 30 or 35 years. So when you look at the integration of China and China's own demography, it's no surprise that the last 30, 35 years have been a disinflationary episode. They have benefited China tremendously, and it has reached its status in the global economy today. But while that was going on, you could see that uh, uh, the, the Chinese urban population was slowly moving to the center um, uh, sorry, rural population was moving into the center, and you could see which way um, urbanization was moving. Not only did uh, rural citizens within China move into the big cities and particularly on the coastlines and became part of the Hukou population, but many rural centers grew so rapidly that they became an urban center. And now, if you if you remember my previous slide, what you can see in both of them is that both those working age population numbers have peaked in 2010. And if you look at the working age population in China, it is now moving lower very, very, very sharply. So the benefits that we've had over the last 30, 30 or 35 years, the demography itself is turning and is turning decisively. That's a change that started in 2010 and the effects I think we haven't seen yet. But while all of this was going on, there was a quiet revolution going on in the advanced economies as well. Women's participation increased tremendously. This is something that emerging economies have not yet seen. It's something that we hope lies ahead of us. But the bulk of the increase in the participation in the workforce for women has already happened. If you look at back in the 1920s and even the 1940s or 50s, you could see that the participation of women in the workforce was very, very low. And, uh, and, and, and they were, they were 
pushed into housework in a way that probably they would not have liked. But what happened later on is the quiet revolution with the introduction of household appliances had a double effect on GDP. As we all know, housework isn't counted in GDP, though it should be, but it isn't. So the impact of having household appliances, washing machine, dishwashers, not only became a significant addition through appliances and GDP, but it freed up tremendous potential through the, women, uh, through the women's participation of the workforce and allowed GDP to rise even faster. The one theme that runs in common with all three of these is that the biggest increases in the labor force or the participation rates are probably behind us. And that leads us to think about what the consequences of a changing demography will be. I, I want to keep this as intuitive as possible. And so I, I want us to think about how workers and dependents uh, affect inflation and how they work through different channels. Um, some of you who will have read your trade theory will remember Stopa Samuelson. Um, this, is, this is a theory or this is our intuition, which is not very different from that. So let's think about dependence and let's think about workers and think about how they are different in their impact on inflation. Dependence, we argue over here, are inflationary. Why is that? Well, from a very simplistic point of view, just for the intuition, we all consume. And as consumers, we take the supply that is in front of us as given. Uh, for a given amount of supply, the consumption demand that all of us generate, whether we're working or not working, young or old, tends to be inflationary, just as a gross effect. When you look at workers, workers consume, but they also produce. However, a worker is generally paid less than the value of his or her marginal product. Otherwise, there would be no point in employing such a person. There are very few individuals in an institution who gain more than the immediate value of marginal product, probably at the highest levels of management, something that becomes very difficult to justify sometimes. But also, when we are paid, we consume a little bit less because we need to save for the future. So out of the wages that we are paid, which are themselves less than the value of marginal product, you get a consumption impulse that also takes into account saving for the future, which means at the end of the day, what workers consume tends to be far less than what they produce in terms of value. And that means workers tend to be deflationary or at least disinflationary. Now, if you look at that chart of the dependency ratio, which is simply the ratio of the young plus the old dependent by the num divided by the number of workers. So if the dependency ratio is falling, it means that there are either more workers for a given number of dependents, the young and the old, or uh, the young and the old as a sum are falling relative to a given value of workers. And what that means is as the number of dependents fall and the number of workers outstrips them so that the dependency ratio falls, the inflationary impulse of the dependents is being outweighed by the deflationary impulse of workers. That's where we've been on the last 30 or 35 years. China's uh, labor supply, its integration with the global economy, and the increasing participation of women all leads to a large increase and a one-time increase in workers, which has tended to be deflationary. Where we are moving now will be a situation where the dependency ratios are rising for the advanced economies in red, you can see that the dependency ratio is rising sharply. Now, some of you may look at the other lines and say, well, emerging and developing economies are not really moving up as quickly, but there's a nuance here. The, the subdued increase in the dependency ratio in the blue, yellow, and the green line are primarily because of Africa, India, and Indonesia. If you take those few countries out, Eastern Europe, North Asia, which includes China, which includes Korea, Taiwan, all of these dependency ratios are actually rising far more aggressively than the red line. In other words, the bulk of the global economy's manufacturing system, which includes North Asia, to a lesser extent Eastern Europe, and certainly the advanced economies, are all aging extremely rapidly. The only parts of the, econ the global economy which are not aging are Sub-Saharan Africa, Indonesia, India, all of which put together do not have a very large footprint as far as global production is concerned. So for the global economy, the manufacturing base of the world and the, the bulk of providers of global growth, aging is a very, very, very serious issue. Second, the channel through which we believe inflation will also rise will be through a political economy channel. Now, 
when when most people think about the elderly, they, they tend to think that the elderly don't consume, right? It, it, it's true. I, I don't think at my age I can I can handle going clubbing uh, anymore um, or have any fanciful consumption ideas. Uh, it certainly doesn't uh, tickle my fancy anymore. However, the the notion that the elderly don't consume is simply incorrect. If you look at the data and the microeconomic data or the macroeconomic data, what you will see is that elderly consumption, particularly in the advanced economies, because there are systems to support them, does increase and increase substantially. And as you might guess, the consumption is predominantly on healthcare. Now, we, we've learned a very, very, very important lesson uh, from COVID, which is that when it comes to protecting the elderly or looking after the needs of the elderly, governments cannot and should not make any distinctions about what their productivity or their contribution to the economy at that time is. Citizens are citizens. And when you think about their rights, we have seen that healthcare budgets have been questioned and raised pretty significantly. And the protection given to the elderly during, during the pandemic has been quite significant. From that point of view, I think we can make the leap and assume, as will the government projections, uh, uh, and they will agree with us, that the, protect, that the protection given to the cons consumption of the elderly, particularly in healthcare services, is actually a fiscal matter, right? This is the debt profile from the Congressional Budget Office in the US. You can look at the Office for Budget Responsibility in the, in the UK. You can look at Euro area statistics. You can look at Scandinavian countries. You can look at almost any advanced economy, most of which are aging, and you will see a very similar projection for debt because of healthcare, because of pensions, and because of the need to look after the elderly into the future. Now, what happens is that we, we have seen a pretty significant increase in debt during the pandemic, and that has worried a lot of people. Um, we have seen debt higher than this before. You can see that spike in World War II, but wars end. The pandemic will end, and we will see pandemic-related debt, just like World War-related debt, falling after that. However, that is not applicable to debt that is related to the elderly. So how then should we deal with debt? What is the end game? Our argument is that the end game is inflation. The best way to deal with it would be to grow out of it. If we could increase growth significantly, then the ability to pay back debt, the sustainability of that debt would increase significantly. No one would have to worry, and we'd just whittle it down over time. But as you'll know, it's very difficult to grow when you've got a demographic headwind in front of you. Uh, growth is nothing but the, but the growth of the labor force and productivity. So we think productivity is going to increase, and you can see that in your day-to-day -day situation as companies look out for labor and find it very hard to find labor, they're trying their best to try and use technology, to try and use machines to do away with as much labor to reduce their dependence. That will happen structurally as well. Uh, if, 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 you, if you look at Japan, Japan has gone into using the elderly part of the workforce quite aggressively, and the services sector there has gone to adopt technology quite aggressively as well. And in fact, as I'll tell you later on, Japan's output per hour has been fantastic. We would all be very lucky to match that output per worker, excuse me, has been fantastic. And we'd all be lucky to match that. But that's been about 2% uh, per year over the last few decades. That is not going to be enough, even if we add growth to it, to get over that mountain of debt. We will have to tax. But you name a tax. And regardless of how sensible it sounds to you, I will show you a ton of people who are willing to oppose that. You may think about carbon taxes and look, it looks like the most natural way and the most sensible way. Almost every economist would agree with it. But you think about what happened in France and President Macron's inability to push through carbon taxes was at the forefront of the, uh, of the protests that we saw in Paris. Think about uh, uh, increasing pension age. Uh, President Putin, who is incredibly popular in Russia, that was the one thing that he could not pass, which is getting and forcing people to work for longer hours. So, so the very easy parts that we see ahead are very actually difficult politically to think about. And that leaves us with inflation. Uh, Milton Friedman very famously said, inflation is taxation without legislation. And that's exactly right. It's a very unattractive, but an incredibly necessary and politically relatively easy way to tax people. Inflation 
uh, is something that if you think about it, can be blamed from one party to the other. Central bank can say, well, look, this is a fiscal problem. Governments can say this is the central bank's uh, task, and you'll see more and more of that as we go ahead. Uh, the truth of the matter is, given the debt profile in, that we have in place, some level of well, inflation will be welcome. If it becomes rampant, then it's a problem for everyone. But a modest level of inflation between 3 to 5% is something that we think we will have to get used to over a period of time. And the question that's uh, pertinent today, just before the session started and Dr. Clark and I had a chance to chat, um, I was taking a look at the comments by Dr. Powell at the Federal Reserve um, and, and Chair Powell essentially said, look, we're going to do whatever needs to be done and we will adjust our policies as time goes by, but we won't do anything very, very quickly. And that has, I, I think that is going to be something that all central banks will have to espouse if they hike interest rates very aggressively they will find it very, very, very difficult to contain growth in a reasonable area. This is a fiscal world, and raising the cost of borrowing simply means that the, the unpleasant monetarist econo uh, arithmetic that some of you may have heard about uh, when you've done your economics, uh, the cost of financing debt is something that could rise very sharply and create greater financial panic. They'll have to tread a very, very, very difficult line. So the bottom line is, I think, looking either at the intuition behind uh, demography or thinking about the way debt relates to demography and how inflation relates to debt, our key conclusion would be that we will end up with more inflation than we think about. There is significant pushback. We are in a minority, and I'm particularly pleased that Dr. Clark has seen um, as, as, as someone, as, as people who could contribute to the debate, um, but the pushback that we get is generally threefold. Number one, most people argue that, well, if growth is going to slow down after uh, a demographic shock, why should inflation not fall? But that is mistaking cyclical for structural. In a cyclical episode, you normally get a slowdown in aggregate demand. You get a gap between the short-run macroeconomic equilibrium and the long-run macroeconomic uh, equilibrium, creating an output gap, which is disinflationary. In demography, which is the right-hand side, potential growth itself shifts lower. And it's not clear that the decline in potential growth and the lower demand um, that it generates creates a negative output gap at all. So there's nothing inherently deflationary about lower growth unless it's a shortfall from potential output. Number two, the biggest question is, well, why didn't it happen in Japan? If Japan has been aging for a very long period of time, it should have happened there first. And actually, the answer is yes and no. One of the biggest problems in analyzing Japan is that people look at Japan in autarky. They look at the falling labor force and they look at uh, inflation that has been subdued and interest rates that have fallen and they attach one to the other. Those of you who are doing behavioral finance will consider this a version of the narrow framing hypothesis. So I've been a little cheeky here. You'll excuse me. It's a bit like a, a quiz and I've taken six charts uh, of uh, debt, the debt service ratio and the interest rate. And I've just removed the country's names from here. And all I'm trying to say, besides uh, giving you a little uh, brain teaser, is that Japan doesn't look remarkable. If you look at the behavior of debt, the behavior of interest rates and the debt service ratios, they look pretty close to identical across the advanced economies. And so Japan was not unique. It was an open economy. It inherited disinflation from China. It inherited falling interest rates just like the rest of the world and was able to ramp up debt just like other advanced economies. Now, if you're curious, Japan's on the upper right-hand side. And you can see that when you look at the red axis, it's the only one that has 250% of GDP, which is a significant margin higher than anywhere else. The third pushback, which is a very recent one, uh, came from an excellent paper that is really worth reading by Mion Straub and Sufi, which was presented at Jackson Hole. Um, and this is really interesting because their presentation argues that the flows related to inequality into financial markets because the rich save so much and their share has gone up so much and a lot of those uh, finances flow into the bond market will push interest rates down by much more than demographic dissaving. It's a really good paper. It's really worth a read. It's really thought provoking. But one of the best things they have done is to quantify an amorphous topic like inequality and relate it directly to financial markets. And for that, we have to really thank them because this is something that we need much more of, particularly for the environment. However, their thesis is not as contradictory as it seems. For example, 
one of the one of the variables that they look at very closely uh, is R star, um, and they use two Fed researchers, Laubach and Williams, uh, their estimates of R star to argue that savings are correlated with a declining uh, real interest rate. On the right hand side, I've got two other Fed economists, uh, Pierce and Schott, who argued that manufacturing employment in the United States fell roughly over the same margin because China's influence meant that many manufacturing jobs moved to China. And as you can see, the title of their paper was The Surprisingly Swift Decline in U.S. Manufacturing Employment. What a fantastic title. Um, and they argued that when China received most favored nation status in the year 2000, a lot of the jobs that were protected by tariffs suddenly moved to China. Manufacturing employment in those labor intensive tasks fell down sharply. The labor was then absorbed into construction and effectively China was able to produce those goods far more cheaply. Now that's interesting because the chart on the left hand side with a falling R star has also been discussed by ex chair, uh, Fed chair Ben Bernanke. And Chair Benanke then came up with this hypothesis called the global savings glut, which argued that the right-hand side chart, which moved a lot of those jobs into China, created great capital inflows into China. It pushed up their FX reserves significantly. And those FX reserves then created what is called an uphill flow of capital back into the US bond market. So it looks like if Mian and Sufi are right, an increase in US inequality pulled R star down, but if Chair Bananke is right, then a decline in global inequality also pulled R star down. So what's responsible for falling interest rates? Is it rising inequality or is it falling inequality? It's a very difficult point to make, but that point disappears if you use our approach. Over the last 20 or 25 years, the ratio of a Chinese worker's wages, which was about 35 times in the year 2000, fell to five times in 2018. That is a factor of seven. And most of those jobs were at the middle manufacturing level. Now, what you see on the chart on the left hand side, uh, which comes from the discussant at Jackson Hole, is that the increasing share of the top 10% was actually the result of the bottom 50% doing very poorly when it came to real wages. This is why there was so much frustration with globalization, because China's emergence, the integration of, uh, of Eastern Europe, and just the outsourcing of many jobs led to a significant impact as far as inequality was concerned. So if you, if you take our approach, demography tends to explain not only the rise of China, but also the rise of US inequality. It explains rising inequality, falling global inequality, and hence is a far more complementary picture then is really being painted by Mian Straub and Sufi. So bottom line is we think our thesis still holds. We think uh, the structural inflation story is well ahead of us. Um, and in the, in the time that I've got left, which is about 10 minutes or so, I'm going to try and bring you up to speed on how we see the more near term future. And there is one very important topic um, that we think has not been really absorbed by central banks, and that is how the Phillips curve is likely to reinvent itself. Now, back in 2014, um, uh, Mr. Hubbard, um, um, sorry, excuse me, Mr. Bullard, uh, in an NPR interview said that in the context of a murder mystery, the Federal Reserve has killed the Phillips curve. Uh, we, we think he might be confessing to a crime that hasn't really happened. The Phillips curve is still alive, but it was put into a coma by China. Uh, if you look at the chart on the left-hand side, this is a estimate, uh, a moving coefficients estimate, if you will, of the Phillips curve. The higher that line goes, the weaker is the connection between employment, uh, the unemployment rate and inflation. So what the chart on the left is showing you is that the Phillips curve got flatter and flatter from the mid 90s, and it became so flat from the year 2000 that the Federal Reserve in 2019 argued that it really has no forecasting power. The problem with this model and models like this of the Phillips curve is they are what we would call reduced form models. They do not ask what the genesis of inflation is. If you're right, the chart on the right hand side comes from the outgoing chief economist of the Bank of England, Andy Haldane, who argued that a large part of the disinflation in the global economy has come from China. 
if that influence is over, then actually the depressing role that China has played on inflation might be gone. And below that, the Phillips curve might still be alive. Central banks don't worry so much because they say, as long as inflation expectations are under control, we're fine. So we ran a very, very simple exercise. All you need is Excel and, and um, uh, two data series over here to do this yourself. We took the five-year Michigan survey, which is the blue line, it's the same in both. And then we said, well, look, let's see whether the forecast of five-year forward-looking uh, Michigan inflation expectations is accurate. So we pretended as if consumers have perfect foresight and we took a forward four, five year average, a moving average, and that's the green line on the right hand side. As you can see, there's not really that much um, correlation with uh, uh, the Michigan uh, survey. We ran all kinds of econometric tests on it and there's no Granger causality, there's no weak exogeneity, there's none of the statistics that really matter. On the left hand side, we said, well, okay, let's try and take a backward look. So we took a five year backward looking moving average. We don't have to do anything more than that. The fit over here is actually incredible. And statistical tests show us that it is actually the backward looking CPI, which influences inflation expectations and not the other way around. So while central banks are very eager to tell us that they've got inflation expectations under control, I think what they have to do is get inflation under control. Because if they don't get inflation under control, our belief is that expectations are backward looking and will respond as they have in the very, very recent past. So you put all of that together and we come up with what we would call a signal extraction problem. How much of the influence in 2022 will be because of COVID and how much will be because of the Phillips curve? Now, this is again a chart from Andy Halde and I love this one um, because you have to try and think about what happened and what's happening even now. All those diamonds were at the were the at the origin in February 2020, and as the pandemic hit, they exploded into these two quadrants. The positive demand shock over here were uh, were demand for takeaway uh, in the very in the very aftermath of the crisis. That was toilet paper as well. Uh, there was a, a huge run. Um, on, on these kind of household amenities. And in the lower left-hand side, there was the coffee shops, there was the hospitality industry, and there were the airlines, and they suffered a massive negative deflationary shock. That story is now trying to converge. The problem is that the pandemic has created two types of distortions. Number one, while money was injected very aggressively into the economies, I'm still at home. I, I make really poor quality coffee at home. I no longer go to my favorite coffee shop uh, which is downtown London, I don't take the services that take me to that coffee shop. And therefore, like the right-hand side, the red line shows me that my personal savings rate relative to disposable income is still at quite high levels. And the left-hand side is telling me that a significant part of the money that used to flow into the services sector has simply collapsed. That's the velocity of money. The issue now is we are all struck by the same storm we are just in different boats. And so we are we, we are confronted with uh, really not knowing what the permanent income hypothesis is telling us to do. So Friedman's permanent income hypothesis would tell us if the shock to our incomes is permanent, we should spend it. If the shock to our incomes is temporary, we should save it. We don't know. I don't know how long I'll be at home. There was a, a, a possibility for a significant amount of travel. Uh, let's see how that pans out. But even if that happens, most people I speak to go to office three days a week. And that is still a large amount of saving as far as they're concerned. They may change their lifestyle. All of that may happen. What consumers have done is that they have spent a significant amount of the money they have saved into a particular good, which is part consumption and part investment. This is the first time that we have seen such an incredibly synchronized house price boom on the left-hand side. And certainly the first time we have seen it so early in the recovery. Usually house price booms take place much later on when unemployment has fallen, where income growth is sufficient, where banks are willing to lend. But this time we just have so much money and we're looking for a place to save it that housing has moved up significantly. And that means rents could move up, which is a significant part of inflation. So it's a very difficult and tricky story to try and de-link COVID-related inflation from cyclical inflation. As the first chart, very first chart showed you, 
what I think is likely to happen is COVID related inflation will probably come down sometime next year. But just at that time, growth will turn out to be stronger. The Phillips curve will kick in and cyclical inflation will turn out to be higher. What that leaves us is with a simple set of conclusions. First, we think inflation is here. You can see it in the statistics. And we think it will stay much longer than many uh, are thinking about. It would be very surprising if US inflation was lower than 3% or 3.5% over, over 2022 and possibly even over 2023. That is not in central bank forecasts. Second, the last 35 years have created significant damage to policy visibility. Central banks are right to say that monetary policy has been prudent and it has pushed inflation and inflation expectations down, but they think they have more control than they actually might. Markets are only partially recognizing that the regime of policy has changed from monetary dominance to fiscal dominance. That will become more apparent as interest rates start going up. Number three, it's inevitable that we'll have green investment, but markets today still reward profits. They're not yet rewarding green profits as much when push comes to shove, which means when profit maximizing firms start to think about how to pay for that green investment, they will have to pass through some of that to consumers and it is likely to be inflationary. Welcome, necessary, but inflationary. Number four, the good news is that inequality will fall. Within country inequality is likely to fall. We wish it had happened with higher growth. It's gonna happen with lower growth, but that's still going to be okay. If you if you look at um, uh, demographer uh, Professor Lee, his projections show you very clearly that per capita GDP is going to do significantly better than GDP growth, and that's something we can look forward to. And the last um, conclusion that we have from here is that the battle between central banks and governments is only beginning. Over the last 30 years, central banks have been at the helm of a regime that has helped move inflation lower, Asset prices have done very well. Home ownership has gone up, and that has been fantastic news for all finance ministers and governments. Now, they will be in a tussle to control inflation, and that means we will have a situation in which central banks will try to raise interest rates to get inflation under control. Governments may not necessarily like that, and that will pit one against the other. The biggest risk to our view is that inflation may happen, but it may happen only after a severe bout of debt deflation if central banks try to use the playbook of the last 30 or 35 years, thinking that inflation will come back down and they aggressively hike rates, something they haven't had to do for quite a while, they will find themselves coming up against financial instability and inability of governments to borrow and just a significant loss of output because of the high level of leverage we've got in the system. Once that's gone, we can go back to an inflationary period, but that may be a very, a very unpleasant time. Um, and on that cheery note, uh, Professor Clark, I'll turn it back to you. So thank you very much, um, Dr. Pradden, for that excellent uh, presentation. Um, we're now going to move to the question and answer session. So if you're online, I want to remind you that you can type your questions into the Q&A session, and then um, I will bring them to Dr. Pradden's attention um, as he as as um, as the discussion goes on. So. Feel free to 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 um, to uh, um, start typing away. And we've got a couple of questions or, or, already. If you're at the um, if you if you're at the um, the in person if you're at the um, at the on campus viewing, then you can give your questions to the uh, staff or volunteers, and they will enter your questions into the in, into the WebEx system. And once again, I will read them to Doc, Dr. Pradana as time goes by. So um, I'm going to take uh, the moderator's um, power and ask my question first. And uh, firstly, I, I'd like to encourage you all to buy the book. The book is fascinating. Um, I've really, really enjoyed re re reading it. Although I will admit I haven't got to the last um, few chapters yet. So um, so uh, forgive if you answer. Uh, forgive me if you answer this in the, in those chapters. But the the one thing that came up in one of your pictures was Africa, and Africa is obviously very different. It's still very young. It's still growing very quickly. They still have large families there, and um, there's very little manufacturing in in in, in Africa overall. Um, and I, I, used, I, I should say, as background, I used to work at the World Bank on the Africa region, and one of the things I was working on was why was Africa 
so bad at um, in manufacturing and would it ever enter enter manufacturing or would it go straight from um, agriculture into services and so what I'd like to know is 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 what's your take on the potential for Africa to to have a kind of to continue this China effect in in the future as um, as companies look for places with lots and lots of cheap labor and young workers and still workers in rural areas who are still able to move into uh, uh, urban areas. Um, it, it's a great question, and I suspect you you you'll know much more about this than I do. Uh, our view, which actually we do think about, there's a there's a uh, there's a chapter that's devoted to where we could be wrong and India and Africa do feature in that there was a prominent paper by Desnet et al which I'm sure you'll be very familiar with which which argued that uh, Africa and India have a significant ability to influence uh, the global economy and I think they do um, I think they'll do fantastically well for themselves the growth rate over there even with a modest amount of productivity the amount of uh, increase in labor force that they've got uh, will will bode very well for their economies it bode very well for uh, welfare uh, over there. Our problem is we wanted to see if India and Africa have the potential to outweigh the demographic headwinds that the entire world faces. So let's take a look at China first. China was incredibly lucky. China was incredibly lucky in the sense that it, its demography was very benign and uh, at a time when the global economy was in a very, very favorable mood as far as globalization was concerned. Now, they face demographic pressure in the sense that the, the administration in China probably looked at very at these, these burgeoning ranks of young people and thought very quickly, how are we going to make sure that they all fit fully employed? And so part of the opening up process, part of the embracing of all these reforms in China was a function of finding jobs for all the young people out there. So when they went out and opened up their economy, when they embraced the the reforms that were required before they received most favored nation status, they were thinking of the domestic economy, but they were very lucky that globalization was in the air. Um, uh, trade was looked upon incredibly favorably, trade barriers were being brought down very aggressively, and the opening up of China and the Pearl River Delta was something that people bought into aggressively as they looked for a way to offshore manufacturing. I think the problem with India and Africa on that front, number one, is that it's very difficult to think that globalization is going to go back to the way it was. There is still a significant amount of angst um, as far as the, the benefits and uh, ills of globalization are concerned. And so we've retreated from our economic globalization. The world is still financially highly integrated, and those links I don't think are going to snap anytime soon. But economically speaking, we have moved away uh, from that story a little bit. The second issue is, well, um, why not why not move uh, some of the labor force over uh, you know you know there's a significant shortage of people particularly uh, in in low productivity services so if people in india and africa um, don't necessarily have the amount of education that is required there's still a lot of jobs that can be pursued over here but the political climate i think whether you're a left or a right wing government is incredibly difficult to do so we don't think that will change uh, uh, in the foreseeable future if you can't take labor, maybe the best thing to do then is to take physical and financial capital from the advanced economies, take them to India and Africa and Indonesia, produce over there, maybe skipping manufacturing as India has done and moved into services, and use the cheap, productive, available labor force that is present in Africa and India and Indonesia and, and use that as a way to catapult them. That will happen. The question is how much? And there are two constraints here. If I think about my own home, uh, home country, uh, India, I think the problem over there is that there is a political friction that is very difficult to overcome. The central government and state governments are often at loggerheads and passing meaningful legislation which will just let investment flow freely into the country. Sometimes it's constraining. India is doing incredibly well. The FDI is, is pouring along, but its ability to transform itself into China seems seems a little bit difficult because the administrative capital is missing. If you look at Africa, Africa, some states in Africa have a, a better ease of doing business score than China, about a third of them, in fact, as you will know better than I do. Um, and, and there is significant potential over there. But if you think of Africa as a continent, its population is roughly the same size as India, but there are more than 50 nation states in there. 
And if they want to develop into a China-like strategy, then you have to find 50 national policies that integrate somewhat seamlessly, even if not perfectly, but pretty well into each other. And I think that coordination problem is what hinders the, the rise of Africa to its full potential. Uh, if you could, if you could, if you could somehow change that, if that changed and we went into a uh, in, into a trade union or a massive monetary union or regulation union, and we could harness the total power of Africa, and I think that would be a game changer. If that happens, I think we would have to change our minds. We haven't seen that yet, but but that would be fantastic. And and in all of this, uh, let me just say that this is one thesis that we would be so happy to be wrong about. Because if we are wrong, it means something has gone very right, uh, and that would improve everyone's lives, including ours. Excellent. Thank you very much. So I've got some questions from the audience, which we'll start with. So we'll start with a question from Amy Stam, and she wants to know, if you were king or, I guess, central banker for a day, how would you set the interest rate to handle inflation? Thank you, Amy. Um, maybe first up questions could have been a little bit easier. Well, first, first I'd get room service. I think those kind of privileges are quite nice. But if I come to your question, I think uh, it's it's a very difficult proposition. The one thing I would urge central banks to do, and I would do myself if I could, is I would make sure that people understood that the current um, perspective on central bank balance sheets is entirely incorrect. Most people. Uh, expect central bank balance sheets to narrow. If you looked at the decision from the Federal Reserve just a few hours ago, they have begun what is known as a tapering process, selling about $15 billion of securities, uh, um, uh, or at least reducing purchases by $15 billion of securities every month uh, in order to try and stabilize the size of their balance sheet. I think this is something that uh, uh, markets are looking at from a very short-term perspective. If you remember the chart on debt that I showed you, if you keep central bank balance sheets at this point in time and the amount of debt goes up, what you're saying is that the two biggest institutions in the country uh, will, will see a gigantic mismatch. The level of debt that goes up will create a massive amount of issuance. And that massive amount of issuance, if it has to be fully absorbed by the private sector, will lead to a tremendous increase in wages. The only way I think you can keep them under control is to create a form of debt forgiveness. And that form of debt forgiveness is essentially by central banks buying that government debt and refinancing it. Effectively, what it means that central banks make government debt a console or an infinitely lived bond, except that in this console, the coupon payment on that bond will vary along with economic conditions. But that, I think, is the only way uh, in which you can actually manage that massive increase in government debt that's coming without damaging the entire economy. If I had to do it for a day, this would be the key message that I would send out. The lovely question. I really liked it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Leah Lopez. She wants to know, many products are now being made in China, as you showed in your slides. Um, do you think bringing factories and manufacturing back into the United States would help with the problem of inflation that we're facing? Um, it really depends on why that manufacturing is coming back. So, so, so let me, th this, this is actually a really, uh, a really important question as well. And it's a very interesting one. And the reason I say that is because we, we tend to think nationally, right? So let's say, uh, let's say output per hour goes up, which means productivity goes up in the United States. We would think that that's a disinflationary prospect, uh, because, uh, you know, the same worker can now produce more output. Uh, you pay them somewhat higher wages, but that uh, that allows you to keep output prices at a reasonable level. So higher productivity, lower inflation. However, what if output per hour is going up in the United States because you are transferring some production from China? Look at it from a firm's point of view. From a firm's point of view, they set up a Chinese manufacturing base because that was the most cost-effective product way of producing that particular good. If they now believe that there is a political economy problem or a supply chain problem or some problem that is not economic in nature uh, in that sense, and they are forced to move some production back to Tennessee or Tallahassee, wherever, wherever that is within the United States, the capex in the US is strictly then second best. So output per hour may go up. The capital to labor ratio in the United States may rise, but it's happening from a second best reason. And from a company's pricing perspective, that means they have an additional cost by producing within the United States compared to China, and that will be inflationary. 
if you find that the US has a advantage because of shale or because of the, the human capital that is significantly higher in the United States, obviously, that's a very different reason. That's a first best reason. For those reasons, I think inflation will fall. But if you bring capital back uh, to the US for second best reasons, I think that would still turn out to be inflationary. And a very similar argument works for, for green investment. If you have green investment uh, because, well, it's the right thing to do, or regulations are pushing you for that, or a certain amount of funds are being allocated for green investment, and hence you think there are positive spillovers from it, that's fine. But then the market has to switch to rewarding you for green profits. If the market does not penalize brown profits, if you will, uh, or uh, does not incentivize green profits to come about uh, as the main form of communication, then firms will again find green investment second best from the point of view of the stock market. And if they want to keep their uh, earnings uh, uh, in a way that still look very good from the stock market's point of view, then they would have to raise prices to pass through some of those increases uh, uh, to consumers. So really, it depends on whether we can foster an environment in which green profits are being rewarded rather than nominal profits, and whether the investment is coming back to the US or wherever it's coming from for first best reasons or second best. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Fernando Diaz, and he wants you. To, he, he's he wants you if you could provide a little bit more information on how it is that demographics um, affect uh, uh, affect inflation. Just uh, just a little more more detail than you provided in your in your slides. Absolutely. I, I think. Um, look, I think the 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 stories are manifold. So I, I've I've outlined just the intuition over there, which is that um, you know the the consumption of the old has to be. Um, um, uh, has to be financed. That's the political economy angle. Um, there are many. There are many instances where you can see this kind of story happening. For example, if you think about uh, the elderly, the, um, the 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 life expectancy in the advanced economies is now in the low 80s. But there are people who are living to 100. There's a book in Japan that was published that made an absolute uh, um, a huge impact over there called the 100 Year Life. And many people are now living much, much older. The issue with this is that as you get older, the increases of neurodegenerative diseases increases exponentially. So you have to be very unlucky to get Alzheimer's or Parkinson's in your 60s. But as you go to your late 70s, the risk of that increases fourfold. As you go to your late 80s, it increases 16-fold. And by the time you're 100, it's nearly universal. Now, I've attended a few uh, uh, conferences. The World Alzheimer's Report tells you that uh, dementia is not uh, a, a necessity. It's preventable. But so far, the success rate has been relatively low. Now, why is this important? It's important for two or three reasons. Number one, it's, it's important because um, you, you can't really deal with it with robotics or AI. You might think you want to, but both Charles and I, my co-author Charles Goodhart and I, we both have personal experience with neurodegenerative diseases in our families. And we can tell you categorically that robots will not be able to deal with it. What the elderly need is something we've said uh, on a regular basis, is empathy. And any robot has the empathy quotient of zero. That's not something that can change. Robots are very good at mechanical tasks, but robots are not able to do idiosyncratic things. And one of the hallmarks of dementia and Parkinson's is that you forget just the most basic and simple tasks. There was a formal study that was uh, conducted in Japan in nursing homes. As it turns out, Japan is very generous uh, with, uh, with uh, helping care for people with dementia uh, and for older people. Um, and the, the cost of their caring to a significant extent is borne by the government. So the government extended a pilot program in which every robot that was used by a nursing home would be given a grant of about $1,000. And they wanted to see what the study uh, generated. Now, the study generated two really interesting uh, um, um, uh, bits of evidence. Number one, it did lower wages, but it lowered wages for part time for people who are working overtime. So there were small robots which would see if beds had been wet at night, and that meant you didn't need people working overtime. But the interesting part is there was no decline in employment in any of the nursing homes that were done. Because mechanical tasks needed to be performed by carers in conjunction with the robots 
for the elderly who are not able to do that themselves. So one of the biggest problems, if you remember those dependency ratio statistics I, I showed you, one of the biggest problems in them is that they do not tell you where the labor will go, okay? Part of the problem is that what we can see is that jobs are being destroyed by technology and you know robots are taking over and that's the kind of story that we see in the newspapers with driverless cars and so on. But we do not anticipate how much of the elderly population and aging population will require workers. So we need people to be uh, we need people to be taken away from higher productivity manufacturing jobs into lower productivity services jobs, which will turn out to be inflationary. That's number one. Number two, if you look simply at at uh, debt, what you will require for that debt to pass through in a way, as I mentioned from the central bank point of view, is you'll need some seniorage revenue. And so in the past, in the last 30 or 35 years, you have not been able to generate much of that because inflation has been falling. If inflation for cyclical or structural reasons is going to rise, I think most central banks and most governments will not stand in the way. Maybe if they were aggressive over inflation, they would bring it down to 2%. But if you looked at that debt profile I showed you, why would a government or a central bank force inflation to be at 2% if they could have it at four or five and allow some of the real burden of debt to go away. And the final part is simply a sectoral imbalance story, right? If the Think of the private sector and the public sector. If the private sector is in surplus and the public sector is in deficit, then the macroeconomic equilibrium is, is automatic. Nothing needs to change. If both of them are in surplus, then you tend to get a deflationary impulse because you're saving too much, the paradox of thrift kicks in. The world that we are moving into uh, if you look at that, again, that CBO chart, is that the public sector is going to be in a significant deficit from here, and aging population saves until a certain point and then starts dissaving as you looked at that consumption profile. So you will have an important part of the private sector dissaving, you will have the public sector dissaving, and the way you restore macroeconomic equilibrium will through be an inflationary cycle. Uh, there, there's much more over here I direct you to my book, but please feel free to email me through Dr. Clark, and I'd be happy to share nuances with you. I'll, I'll leave it there in the interest of time. Thank you. Um, our next question is again from Amy Stam, and she wants to know, how do you discern between the increase in price between raw materials to build homes and people want to buying, want to, wanting to buy because they have more savings in terms of house prices? And I guess my addendum to this question is, how much do you think um, this could be released by, um, for example, reducing zoning requirements to allow more construction than, than we have, which I guess is a, a particular problem in the United Kingdom at the moment. It really is the green spaces over here and, and the unwillingness to open those up um, has constrained housing to a significant extent. It's a hugely political problem. I don't see any resolution to that anytime soon. Uh, well, primarily because a lot of the existing home owner, uh, homeowners uh, object to it quite strenuously because it reduces the value of their homes a lot. So there is there is upward political pressure. The UK, as you know, uh, is very fierce about its home ownership. Um, and anytime there's pressure on that on the housing market or housing goes into deflation, it's a huge political problem. So your, your answer, I, uh, your question, I'm afraid, uh, Dr. Kark, I really don't have a very good answer for. Uh, the, the best I can tell you is I don't see it happening. Um, but the second one, uh, which is Amy's question again, thanks for that. Uh, it, it's 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 equally hard. It's very difficult to tell which part of uh, which part of the increase is related to the lack of construction, which part is due to um, a higher savings. Let me let me let me tie that in the following way. The pandemic has delivered significant personal savings, right? Uh, if you look at ECB research, I think it was a June um, 2020 bulletin. They were very clear that an econometric study in this, and they said personal savings are not happening for precautionary reasons. So people are not saying there's high unemployment. I've got a problem over here, um, and I don't want to spend because that usually kicks in uh, as far as the paradox of thrift is concerned. You save a lot, you don't consume, you're worried, and that sends the economy into a tailspin. Here, there were two segments of the population. One segment of the population is those who could work remotely or those who managed to keep their jobs in the manufacturing sector, and in fact, uh, earned a lot more, um, and, and their incomes were protected. However, their lifestyle changed because, you know, I, I went to see my family in India uh, about two weeks ago for the first time in two years. Before that, I was, I was very privileged and very lucky to be able to go about four to five times a year. I haven't traveled for business anywhere in two years. Uh, I, I wish I could have traveled to you, but I haven't done that either, which means 
all my travel expenses, all of those have just been for savings and I'm looking for a place to put them. Now that release of savings into the housing market is what creates that excess demand. Against that excess demand, you've got problems in China, which is an integral part of that supply chain. Um, speaking to uh, some of my friends who are in the shipping industry, they tell me that the entire supply of shipping containers has been sold out for the next 18 months. There's nothing more to give. Some of them are thinking on going on holidays, but Maersk, which is one of the biggest shipping companies in the world, on their recent call and in the Financial Times, told us that there's so much demand and such a shortage of supply that they are now thinking of getting into air freight, which is obviously going to be expensive to the question that someone else had asked. You know, if you take a second best solution, that's going to be inflationary. But such are the constraints that that excess demand flowing from high savings is really creating a shortage of raw materials. We're not equipped to deal with such large surges. There's a lack of labor force, and that is creating an increase in the price of those materials where the supply is constrained. So, so your question really is, is joined at the hip. If it wasn't for those excess savings, we wouldn't get the flow of demand. If it wasn't for the flow of demand, the shortage of raw materials would not be as apparent. And if that shortage wasn't as apparent, we would not get those spikes in prices which are constraining people. And if I may add one more part to your question, it's that people are saying, look, uh, I, I want a house, but I don't need it tomorrow. I've got a rental or I've got a house that I'm living in right now. If these prices are so high, I'll wait six months. People are looking at used cars, seeing prices go up by 10 and 15% and saying, well, I'm not gonna pay 15% more for a used car. I'll just wait six months till the chip shortage is done. And what that is doing is it's crushing demand in the near term much of which will materialize later on. But for the near term, it's pushing those lumber prices high. It's pushing construction lower because there aren't enough people in material. And it's creating what markets are now calling a stagflationary regime. And that's the problem that needs to be solved before inflation can come down, but supply goes up. So, so your question is really, really a very good one. And it is joined at the hip. Thank you. Our next question is from Homero Gonzalez, and he says um, he wants to talk about the the, the recent inflation. Um, how do you think stimulus checks given to those who qualified affected the economy of the United States? Will prices increase even more to make up for it? How how bad can it get? And what do you see the pros and cons of these stimulus checks? Uh, well, let, let's start with let's start with the genesis of this stimulus check, right? Um, you, you're running a business. The government tells you you can't run it anymore. This is this is a regulation that is forced upon you in a society in which you were told you will not be told not to run a particular business. It is very difficult for the government to walk away and say we have no responsibility in the in the in in in, 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 in to benefit the greater good. We're going to take the livelihood off of half of the population of the services sector. It's not possible. In the UK, in the United States, in the Euro area, and most of the advanced economies, furlough schemes or unemployment insurance was almost inevitable when the government told you that, look, you can't do your job because there's a public health problem over here. So the genesis of the stimulus check was essentially a responsibility that the government could not walk away from. The second question that's related to what you're asking is, how were those stimulus checks handed out? In the UK, for example, they were handed out through furlough schemes, which basically meant that a company could say, I'm gonna put 70% of my uh, workforce on furlough. You can stay home and we'll, we'll keep you on the payroll, but we'll keep you on the payroll in a way that the government pays your wages. I don't have to pay your wages. So the company could still operate with 30% of the workforce, which was all it needed. And the 70%, which was still on the payroll would be paid by the government. So under those conditions, Unemployment looked naturally low, but as the furlough scheme began to wane off, the government's bet was, and it's done actually quite well, is that, well, the matching between employers and employees would still be in pretty good shape. And the company could decide, well, out of the 70 workers that I put on furlough, maybe I only want 40 more and the other 30 I have to let go. But actually, as it's turned out, the demand for labor as the economy is opened up has been pretty strong and people are struggling to find workers. In the United States, in a much more flexible labor environment, they say, look, companies can fire whoever they want. Um, and the difference over there being in Europe, 
companies have to pay for healthcare in the United States. That's not uh, sorry. In the United States, they have to pay for healthcare. In the in the UK and the Euro area, the government pays for healthcare through a national system. So the burden on firms is completely different. And to ease the burden on firms, uh, you are allowed to put uh, to to lay people off. And the stimulus checks came in to say, well, if you're laid off, uh, we'll give you a stimulus check. It just wasn't. A, a link through the company, which has worked in the UK and the Euro area reasonably well, but in fact, in the US, you would you would see that there were, as I said, two segments of the population, one segment of the population that retained its job and found that its savings went up. And the other segment of the population that was given a stimulus check, many of those stimulus checks were in excess of their incomes, but effectively, if you had asked me this question three months ago, I would not have had a very good answer for you. But what we've seen is, as the stimulus checks have stopped in September, people have not come back to work in droves. Either it's because they are looking at the sectors they worked in as risky, and by risky, I don't mean that I'll catch COVID. That is a concern for many people, a valid concern for many people, but just think of the hospitality industry. I'll go back to work in there, maybe shun another opportunity or uh, commit myself to work again. And if there's another wave or some other variant that comes in, that story could get shut down again. So people's willingness to commit to high risk sectors, which have been affected and could be affected again by COVID has probably kept them away. Uh, and, 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 and that's been one of the issues here. So it's very difficult to say what has been the benefit and what has been the downside. I would argue that in the first year first, it was impossible not to have unemployment benefits or furlough checks. But the way they could have been tapered off perhaps could have been a little bit better. And at least in the United States, I think one of the issues was they did not retain the link between firms and workers. As, you, as, as we all know, the matching between firms and workers is a very expensive process. And that was done better in Europe and in the United Kingdom than it was done in the US. That I think is one of the biggest cons that we can see. The pros are impossible to argue with. Our next question is from Alan Lopez, and he's worried about uh, what's going to happen to the stock market. So, in particular, um, you were talking about um, the Fed, the Federal Reserve, and uh, central banks stopping purchases. As um, and he wants to know how do you think this is going to happen to the stock? What do you think is going to happen to the stock market? Do you think it's going to crash? I mean, they 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 do crash. It's a very, very early stage of the cycle for these kind of crashes to happen. Typically speaking, what happens in such early parts of the recovery is if the stock market gets ahead of itself, it's at all time highs right now. Um, it's because the recovery is gathering speed. So there's a lot of optimism that things will resolve themselves. There had been an inflation concern, but central banks uh, are being forced, some would say by markets to adjust to this new reality. And there are a lot of hikes that markets now expect for central banks and it's very difficult for central banks to back away. So the new public enemy number one seems to have kind of been dealt with. But despite that real interest rates, inflation adjusted interest rates are still very negative. There's still a lot of liquidity in the system because purchases have only been reduced. The balance sheet is not going to go back down to zero. Uh, they're going to continue to buy a large amount of assets every month. And, and, and that all of that is holding up the stock market. Typically speaking, stock market corrections um, give lease to a renewed interest in equities. The crash comes under two circumstances. Number one is if you create a recession and that recession means, you know, a decline in 10 year yields and interest rates are not able to protect earnings. Earnings fall and as earnings fall because growth falls, the equity market takes a hit or even worse, you create a crisis. And, and that crisis can be created by quite a few things, right? It can be created by a very aggressive central bank, um, or it can be created by debt rising to an extent that the market is not able to absorb that anymore. We've seen both episodes of that happening in uh, Turkey and Argentina. We've seen that happen in Finland. We've seen that happen in the UK. Uh, it's not something that we should rule out, but I will say that one of the really interesting things about the pandemic when it started in 2020 is that no part of the world really looked like it had significant excesses. Uh, household debt had been dealt with in the United States and in the UK. Europe had gone through a significant crisis um, and come out on the other side. China had gone through a massive housing bust um, and again come out on the other side. Emerging markets had been heavily chastised um, and had cleaned up their current accounts and had cleaned up their inflation problems. 
and it didn't look like there would be anything but really grudging, uh, grinding growth upwards in 2020. That was before the pandemic hit. The pandemic has transformed that. We've had fiscal policy deploy deployed in a way that was unimaginable until then. Monetary policy has financed it, and I don't think we should worry about a real stock market collapse until we reach a much more advanced stage. Or what can happen is uh, a lot of the central banks that have been pushed into hikes, if they deliver those hikes, then we might have to worry about that. But I doubt that is something that will happen over the next year or two. Thank you. Um, the next question kind of relates to my question. My first question was about how Africa was going to affect the economies of, um, of, of Europe. And Patricia Andrea, what she wants to know is, um, how do you see these trends affect, affecting Africa? You know, Af she says Africa has primarily been in natural resources, exporting especially to China. And um, do you, how, how will these demographic changes throughout the world affect the African economies? Uh, again, it, 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 related, very much related to your question, I think the African economies are likely to do very well, um, depending on how well they can marshal their political economy. So one of the one of the things that investors look for the most uh, is regulatory protection, consistency, and the ease of being able to go in and out of an economy. If you're China, you don't have to worry about a lot of that because your regulations can be tailored to the domestic needs because your economy is just so huge that most multinationals cannot afford not to have a stake in the Chinese pie. But if you're Africa, if you're uh, even if you're a, a, a huge economy like India, you have to tread very carefully. You have to provide them with a uh, with a reasonably level playing field, some kind of access to your market. But I think what the Chinese did extremely, extremely well was they pushed most incoming capital into joint ventures. The, the, the problem, the risk, I think, for Africa and for India is they allow multinationals to come in um, and don't have a way to transfer some of that technology into local domestic firms. It has to be a mutual agreement where the multinational benefits from the tremendous potential that Africa and India have, and in return, they transfer some of their know-how. I'm not talking about technological patents. I think that's I think that's off the charts. But the way of doing business, how you use managerial expertise, how you manage supply chains, if you've got a joint venture, you get some local knowledge, you get some global knowledge, you put the two of them together, you get the multinational benefiting from the huge opportunities uh, available, and you get the joint venture partner benefiting from some of the managerial know-how. Um, I, I think if, if that model is to be pursued, the benefits that, sta that Africa stands to gain are, are just tremendous. Uh, it'll be huge uh, because countries are looking for places where there is cheaper labor, they are looking for places where they don't have the same headwinds, where they don't have an aging population. I mean, just, just think about uh, diapers, right? Uh, a company that is selling products for kids or selling education needs is hardly likely to have a massive footprint in China or Japan. These are aging societies. The kind of companies that will go there are the ones that are looking at silver tech, right? Looking after the elderly. Uh, doing medical services, but so what are these existing companies which have specialized in looking after the young? What are they going to do? These markets are ripe for them, and they can have a significant impact on those economies. But again, as I said, you you do need some quid pro quo. You need to be able to give those countries access. You need to be able to calm them down and say, look, you can come in and you go. We will not change regulations overnight to either take away your patents or infringe on uh, your ability to operate in this country. But in return, let's have a little bit of managerial expertise, know-how, let's have a joint venture that allows our companies to flourish as well. Under those circumstances, I think you'll, you'll, you'll see much greater benefits. I would use that as a roadmap. If you see that happening in a particular country, I would be far more optimistic about that. Thank you. Our, our next question is from Beatrice Sepulveda. And what she wants to know is, you know, given your generally gloomy macroeconomic outlook with inflation rising, what do you think um, will, will happen to job opportunities uh, over in, in the future? I mean, the, 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 the thing with job opportunities is that 
they tend they tend to evolve um, extremely flexibly. This is this is not this is this is not a doomsday scenario. For example, when, when we talk about demography and we talk about an aging population, we are talking about running out of workers. So from our perspective, I don't think jobs are really an issue. The kind of job that you will get matters. I'll explain that in a second. If you look at the tech guys, the tech guys are the ones who uh, worry about running out of jobs. Um, and so the answer must be somewhere between the two. We can't both be right. We could be when sectors are concerned. So there'll be some sectors in which you really don't find much employment. I mean, it's very rare that you've gone to a travel agent to book your travels in the last 20 years. Some of you may not even know what a travel agent is. I'm, I'm, I'm old enough to have used one quite a bit in my youth. Um, we don't use them anymore. I mean, we, we've got all the websites in the world that you can think about buying health insurance. Uh, most of that is done online. And and so print media, another one, right? A lot of that has turned online and you don't really need people to do that job anymore. But there are value added opportunities in each of those sectors for people with human capital. So one of the things that has happened to the stock market is that the stock market has become increasingly dominated by companies that don't have a huge human footprint. So Google is absolutely gigantic, but the number of people that it employs per unit of its revenues is incredibly small compared to a GM or to a Ford. That is changing. There's no doubt about that. Yet, I think we might be too gloomy in our prognosis. For one, the services sector will be expanding in an absolutely gigantic way to look after the elderly and to look after an aging population. And that doesn't mean just people who will hold the hand of an older person. It's a very, very important social job, but economically speaking, you will have to absorb a ton of people who will look into longevity research, who will try and run and administer companies that help look after the elderly, that help look after an aging population, and that try to get the best productivity out of them. Participation rates of the over 65s in the United States have been rising for the last 20 years. Uh, the people between 55 to 65 in Europe, the participation rate for them is now between 60 and 70 percent. How do you get the best out of these experienced workers is a puzzle that I think will be solved through greater job creation. I'm not gloomy about the prospect of jobs. As I said, productivity is going to go up, but what will happen is you will get a reallocation of jobs. Some of the low value added jobs that are going to be destroyed in manufacturing, unfortunately, the outlook for those workers is to go into even lower productivity jobs looking after the elderly. Emerging markets have a lot of promise because now if you look at technology, they don't need to have a fleet of taxis. If you look at New York the, or London, the, the black cabs and the yellow cabs are at serious risk because of Uber and Bolt and all these app sharing services. But in emerging markets, capital is dear, and they would normally have had to build a massive fleet of urban transportation, which they don't have to anymore. A private car can replace a taxi, so they're skipping a generation of capital formation and making their productivity reach higher levels without the cost that it used to. The, the, the promise of emerging markets is still absolutely gigantic, and we need to think beyond the definition of a labor force uh, uh, within a country to be able to exploit the global advantage. I wouldn't be as worried. The threat of inflation is a significant one, but it means that if you're at a university and you've got significant human capital, I think you'll be able to weather the storm just fine. Our next question is from Ramon Rodriguez, and he wants to know about how the advent of rising inflation is going to affect um, cryptocurrency and its role in the economy over time. Wow, um, I was just having a conversation about this, about uh, one of my peers who has stopped doing general macroeconomic analysis. Um, and he, he says that the future of macroeconomics is basically cryptocurrencies and digital currencies. I, I, I will excuse myself from this one. I am an absolute novice. I, I went through the process of buying Bitcoin at 5,000 and 6,000, and I just never followed through with it. Um, and, and because of that, I'm still making my coffee at home with instant coffee. It's not a barista machine or anything like that. I, I, I find it very difficult to think of a fundamental valuation for such new assets. I can see uh, very easily that they have multiple uses um, as, as a means of payment, but the platforms are so diverse that it's very difficult to see what value they will provide on a day-to-day -day transaction basis. Do excuse me, I apologize. This is not something that you should hear from me at all. 
Okay, I think we have time for one more question. So this this is a final question from um, David Lamb. And what he wants, he firstly he's looking forward to reading your book. So um, very kind. Thank so you. That's good. And um, he also wants to know in relation to your research and and and, and the demographics, um, the old population in the U.S. and China. What would you recommend for specific long-term investment areas? Okay, it's a very good question, um, uh, David. I hope you enjoy the book. It's it's we've tried to write it in a more leisurely style rather than being very academic and. Uh, you know, referring to papers all the time and things like that. We've got lots of charts in there, which help explain our point a little bit. There's a lot of data in there, and hope you. I hope you like it. Thank you for that. Um, the 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 answer to some of your questions actually came from the last one. Um, I think it was Ramon's question, which asked about uh, um, what will happen to jobs. Um, I forget whose it was. I apologize. Um, but but some of the clues to where our investment may lie really comes out from that question. For one, where you see productivity rising or you see growth uh, will be places where you will be able to protect your investment. But before we even get to that, look at the bond market. The US bond market uh, is one of the most incredibly rich and diverse bond markets in the world. And nominal bond yields are broken into two parts. There is something called uh, inflation protected uh, bonds, which protect, which, which are called real yields. And the difference between nominal yields and these real yields are called break-even inflation. Uh, as financial institutions, not as an individual, you're able to buy break-even inflation. And break-even inflation should protect you against inflation prints that turn out to be significantly higher. If you look today, break-even inflation is trading above nominal yields almost all over the maturity spectrum. So investors are clued onto that. The problem is that the quality of earnings in the equity market will get affected by inflation. So you should be looking at one of three opportunities. You should be looking at parts of the industry that have not yet gotten mechanized. And that's why the pursuit of driverless cars and AI is so aggressive is because things like printers and things like uh, um, you know, answering machines and, and, and things like travel agents, as I mentioned, it's already passe. It's already all in the price. Everything's happened. No more surprises in there. What can surprise us with the change is something that most people would pursue because that's a way to reduce dependence on labor. That's a way to uh, really embrace technology and it will turn out to raise productivity significantly. That's number one. Number two, growth areas. So what we've seen in the pandemic is that the NHS, which is the healthcare system of the United Kingdom, the healthcare system of the United States, and even Scandinavian countries have underinvestment quite significantly in healthcare. And you can bet that they are in panic about how to look after the elderly. There will be lots and lots of new tech companies or other companies that will spring up to look after the needs of the elderly. It's a growing market. It's a burgeoning market. And particularly in the United States and the UK, governments don't fully compensate you if you have neurodegenerative disease, unless it's a very severe one, which means a lot of that cost has to be borne by you or your family members. And there'll be companies that spring up to deal with that. And number three, look at productive emerging markets. That's where the most promising bets can come from. Over the last five years, Emerging markets have really done very badly. So when I was at Morgan Stanley, something that Dr. Clark had mentioned, um, my my uh, emerging market traders used to call me the EM hater because um, I had I had helped coin a term. You can Google it later if you want, called the Fragile Five. And the Fragile Five uh, were Brazil, uh, India, South Africa, Turkey, and Indonesia. And these countries had severely broken growth models. Um, uh, if you're doing um, uh, your economics courses, you may have uh, read about the Dutch disease. A couple of countries had that. Um, even Canada has got it. Well, so it's not very rare, but uh, they, they really suffered from the lack of a growth model um, and their ability to grow, their ability to provide returns has come under increasing question in that last decade. Now things are changing with their backs to the wall. They've been able to cut interest rates. They've been forced to push through reforms and find themselves a new model of growth. I think Half the EM world, uh, the emerging market world, is actually embracing a new model of growth. They have embarked upon a very different path that, than they used to before, and the rate of return in those economies is going to be quite significant. While, while you may hear of all the doom and gloom in China, the amount of innovation that is being carried over there is absolutely astounding. I think you should pay a lot of attention to that.
that. Uh, Dr. Clark mentioned Africa. There are tremendous opportunities in Africa. South Africa, as an example, has a new um, uh, a leader, uh, President Ramaphosa, who has transformed the way most people will look at that country in the next five to 10 years. Uh, India, uh, Central and Eastern Europe, um, all these countries are developing models of growth that really are promising and need to be looked at. That could be one of the places in which most financial institutions are not impressed. And that's a good thing because it means the valuation of those countries has not really gone up. You can still find substantial growth from here, particularly if you're looking at a horizon that is a couple of decades. There are opportunities. There are jobs. We just have to be able to find um, a strategic vision to look at them and find the right ones. Thank you very much. Now that's that's it for the questions. Um, so I'd like to thank um, everyone who's made this possible. First, I'd like to thank Dr. Pradhan for his excellent and thought provoking um, presentation. And I would like, encourage you to, to to get his book and to and to read it. It's it's just fascinating. Um, I'd also like to thank once again our sponsors at IBC and Commerce Bank for making this uh, possible. Um, but also, I, I need to stress that this event couldn't have happened without the behind the scenes work of all the staff at TAMIU. So I'd like to thank our um, um, OIT for their technical support and event services at TAMIU for helping us set up the event. Um, most importantly, I'd like to thank all the staff at the Center for the Study of Western Hemispheric Trade and the AR Sanchez School of Business who put in a lot of hard work to make this happen. And so thank you to all of you. We really appreciate it. And of course, to our volunteers from the Sanchez School of Business Dean Student Council Advisory, who have been assisting with helping managing the event today. Um, finally, I'd like to thank the Associate Director of the Center, um, Miss Amy Palacios. Um, she's done all the hard work organizing this, this, this event, and it, it couldn't have happened without her. So, and the final person I, I really need to think is I want to thank all the faculty who encouraged their students to attend, and I want to encourage all the students and other people who did attend this, this wonderful event. So, thank you all for coming, and we look forward to seeing you all again in in march for our for our next talk so thank you thank you very much from my side as well it was a real pleasure being here thank you dr clark um, amy thank you very much and thank you for the university